What is your name? My name is John Cook. Where were you born? I was born uh, in Buffalo, New York. What were your early years like? I spent most of my early years in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we moved from Buffalo to Brooklyn when I was young. I don't remember anything about Buffalo. My early remembrances are in Brooklyn. Uh, we moved a lot. We went and lived in four different places in Flatbush. Uh, it was quite an interesting time there. I'd like to add a couple a couple of things. Um, you grew up in New York. Yes. Can you tell us what life was like in New York back in the, I guess it would have been the 1930s and 40s that you well, went up there? Yeah. Um, one thing I remember is the, uh, we had both horse-drawn uh, vehicles as well as cars. Uh, we had ice men because there wasn't much in the way of refrigeration, so the ice man would come around with a horse-drawn cart. Uh, we also had the milkman would come in a, in a horse. And that was real good for him because uh, the milkman would be able to get a bunch of milk, carry it to the house, and then go from house to house until he emptied up this little package of milk. But the horse knew the rule. And the horse would go along without him, so that the uh, the milkman would go, you know, just from the uh, from the houses where he delivered the milk uh, back to the uh, the car to get some more, and then the horse would just keep up with him. One of the problems, though, with uh, old horses is because they uh, they left their residue. <laughs> You don't find them anymore, but at that time there were a lot of uh, street cleaners. They had a big room, a big uh, thing to sweep the manure into. And people were real happy when the automobile came along because they got rid of all of that pollution. Little knowing that what pollution cars are going to bring. But, uh, the subway system was interesting too. We lived in one place close to the uh, an exit to one of the subways, the BMT, Brooklyn Manhattan Transit. Uh, it, only, it was only an exit, so uh, they had a kind of a cage uh, turnstile that people could go through to get out of the subway, but you couldn't get back in unless you were a little boy and you could sneak under. Uh, and we used to uh, take some free rides on the subways. The, uh, the end of the one line that we were on was Coney Island. And uh, we'd get out to Coney Island. When we uh, got there, uh, the station was above ground, so that uh, we had to climb up the outside of the uh, railroad station and get back on and get home. But uh, it was five cents for a ride on the subway, and you could go any place in New York City except for Staten Island, which had to use a ferry. Uh, I checked this morning, it's $2.50 now for a ride on the subway. But for five cents, you could go any place you want to in the city. Can you tell us, uh, back in the day, what type of things did they have in Coney Island? Because that was kind of the precursor to the modern day amusement parks that we have today, yeah, right? right. What, kind of, what kind of attractions did they have there that you could see? Well, they had Luna Park, uh, Steeplechase. The Steeplechase was, it's like a uh, roller coaster, except that you sat on a horse, like a merry-go-round horse. And you went, uh, it was kind of scary. <laughs> But uh, they had roller coasters there and merry grounds and that type of stuff. Hot dogs. Growing up in New York City, did you have like certain things that you did for entertainment? Or hey, you probably didn't have much money growing up in Missouri in there too, or you had to improvise your entertainment? Yeah, well, this was uh, from, let's see, 19, it was during the, during the Depression. 
so there wasn't much money available for anybody. My father, fortunately, had a fairly decent job, so we always had food on the table. We had never had any problems with uh, uh, with money, except that there wasn't very much available. How did war events affect your life? Uh, I graduated high school in uh, <clears throat> June of 1941. Uh, I went to work for AT&T in July of 1941, and in December of 1941, I was attending a, uh, uh, a dance given by the local girls, and uh, that's when we heard the announcement that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. So, uh, being 18 years old at the time, I was prime fodder for the war effort there. I uh, volunteered for the uh, Army Air Force in the next January, but my folks wouldn't sign the papers. I was too young. And I ended up uh, enlisting in the U.S. Navy. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, graduated from the uh, Navy program for uh, pilots and went into the uh, instru I ended up as an instructor in uh, primary flight. Could you tell us about your time in the military? When I looked through some of the pictures that you seen, you had some shots from Korea. Were you based there or uh, yeah. was a little bit about uh, your military? Korea was interesting. Um, the uh, uh, Korea itself was ruled by Japan for many years before the war. And when the uh, when World War II was over with, the Japanese were kicked out of Korea. But unfortunately, uh, the Japanese had all of the technical jobs in Korea. The Koreans were limited to janitor work and that type of thing. Uh, so the communications, uh, there was a cable system that went from Tokyo uh, to southern Japan, across into the uh, Korean Peninsula to Busan, and then on up uh, through Seoul, uh, up into the uh, capital of North Korea, Pyongyang, uh, whatever it is. Uh, it had. Uh, the capacity for uh, 70 uh, circuits on this cable system. There was 10 quads, and each one could take seven circuits on it. Uh, however, by the time the Korean War broke out, there was only one circuit going out of those 70. And the, uh, the press was particularly unhappy because they couldn't get their stories back. There was no communications. Uh, the, uh, the Army sent over a bunch of their experts on cable systems, and their airplane crashed and killed them all. So uh, they came to the telephone company asking for volunteers to uh, work on that cable system. And I happened to be one of Ten people who volunteered. I was the only one with a family. I had a wife and two little kids at the time. But uh, we were living in a, uh, a small apartment over a garage. It was a one-bedroom apartment, and the two kids and my wife and I, we broke it up and we made do with what we had. I was making about fifty, sixty dollars a week with uh, very little chance of uh, building a house without just religion week to week. But when this uh, opportunity came along, they asked us one afternoon whether we were interested in going, doing this job. They wanted an answer by five o'clock. Well, I was kind of desperate. I wanted to do something better than what we had, so I called the wife up told her. She agreed. So, uh, volunteered went over. 
the um, Western Electric did the contract negotiations with the Army, and they, they uh, negotiated a real good contract. Uh, we had the equivalence of a, uh, somewhere between a, uh, a lieutenant colonel and a colonel, as far as salary is concerned. So, um, but anyway, we made enough money on that to uh, build a house, and from then on we always had a equity in the house. But we, uh, we got there, we put uh, their, their terminal equipment on a cable was all shot. It was just no good. But the Army had some uh, equipment in a bay of equipment that, that you could put four circuits on one cable. So uh, we, uh, we hooked up the Army's equipment to the cables and got them communications. And uh, after about, uh, well, when I first went over to Korea, there was just this perimeter around Pusan. Uh, the North Koreans had come and they had practically overrun the entire country except for this small perimeter. But uh, MacArthur had his forces uh, go around and invade Korea uh, north of where, uh, north of Seoul actually, or in, in that vicinity and cut off the whole South Korean army. So they immediately withdrew, and our forces uh, went north, went up to, uh, through Seoul, up to uh, the Korean capital, up to the Yellow River, which is uh, the border between North Korea and China. Well, this scared the Chinese. They, they didn't like that at all. That's when the Chinese got involved. And when they got involved, uh, their supply lines, of course, were, you know, very short. Ours were thousands of miles away. And they had the manpower. And they pushed us right back. And not all the way back to uh, just Busan, uh, but uh, just south of Seoul. And things still made it there. Um, and about that time, uh, my one year was up, they uh, asked if we would stay on, but uh, I couldn't see any anything that we could do to help other than what we had already done. The, uh, the Air Forces could maintain what we had set up, so uh, went home. Please tell me about your career with AT&T. One of the things that uh, I went through that I thought might be of interest is uh, during the Cold War, um, 1970, uh, we were involved with a, uh, developing an anti-ballistic missile system. Uh, I don't know whether you remember that or not, but um, the anti-ballistic missile system was a system where they would send up a rocket, the enemy would, and we would send up another one, and they would meet in the upper atmosphere, and then one would explode the other one. Well, a high-altitude explosion or a nuclear warhead uh, uh, doesn't cause any damage, shouldn't anyway, because it's you know, way up in the air, except it produces an electromagnetic pulse. Uh, which is similar to, to lightning, except uh, uh, lightning has a lot of current with it. Uh, it. It goes up this way and comes down that way, and what's in between is, uh, is your current. The electromagnetic pulse, or the EMP, goes up and almost straight down again. So it has the voltage of a lightning, but it doesn't have the current. And when they exploded these in the Pacific, they found that it affected the communications in the Hawaiian Islands. So if you're going to have a system that's going to knock out 
an incoming ballistic missile and they're going to explode up in the air, you want to make sure that the damage to your communications isn't going to affect your ability to set off these rockets. And we had our rockets in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and the control system for that was in Colorado Springs, in the big mountain there. And the communications between them was by the uh, AT&T. So they needed to uh, do some testing. And uh, they set up a, a task force made up of uh, a couple of Army guys, uh, Bell Lab engineers, uh, the MITRE Corporation, which was a scientific organization, and uh, some Army contractors who built and did the, the, uh, the main work, and me. Uh, and my job was to make sure that the, uh, the maintain the safety of our people in these uh, places that they were going to test and also to make sure that the, uh, the telephone service wasn't too badly. We figured there would be some damage, but we wanted to minimize the damage. Um, we started off uh, with a little place in Shiner, Texas, which is halfway between San Antonio and Houston, and it's way out in the sticks. The only thing about Shiner is that uh, they have a brewery there. And you can buy China beer at the local store here. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was a microwave station. It had you know, a big tower with the antennas on it and a building below it. We have one similar to that uh, between, if you go on the uh, bypass from uh, it's on the left going, when you're going south, uh, between uh, the old Walmart. And, but anyway, this is out in the sticks. And we built a, uh, a another building and another tower so that we could bypass the regular building if something happened to it. And we, uh, we built this device which would simulate the EMP and a uh, antenna that would produce the EMP over the building. And uh, we zapped it. And fortunately, uh, things went okay. In fact, one time, uh, one of the uh, engineers from Bell Labs convinced me to stand underneath the antenna when they zapped it. And I didn't have any children after that, but uh, I'm not sure that was a problem or not. But anyway, I did it, and there uh, was no, no, uh, no damage. But we found out that it would affect uh, small circuits, uh, what do you call them, uh, microchips, that type of thing. It wouldn't affect vacuum tubes, or the, and, and most of the stuff that we had at that time was uh, the old-fashioned old vacuum tubes. Uh, but we, uh, we tested that place, then we went to uh, larger and larger offices doing the same type of thing. We had one place where we uh, actually had an antenna dangling from a helicopter, and we zapped the building with that. But then both the Russians and our people developed uh, MIRVs. It's a, where you send up a rocket and then that bursts into 10 or more different uh, vehicles which were with different, 10 different targets. And there was no way that you could, uh, with the system that we were developing anyway, protect against something like that. So we signed a treaty with, with, uh, with the Russians, the SALT Treaty. Uh, which uh, limited us from any developing any anti-ballistic missile system. Of course, now we're in business again, but uh, we're not dealing with Russia and their capabilities. We're dealing with people who can send up one rocket, maybe, 
So um, we're back in the business of anti-ballistic missiles. With all this, you know, high-tech science that we were doing, did you, after you graduated high school and entered the Army, did you ever go back to formal education or no, I didn't. just learning on the job? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I ended up uh, in the engineering department with a bunch of engineers. In fact, I had engineers working for me. But uh, I learned most of it on the job. Did a little study. I took uh, correspondence courses, built a television set one time. How did you end up in McNow County? Well, that's a long story. Uh, we had our 25th wedding anniversary in uh, 1970, and we decided to take a trip to the uh, uh, to the Rocky Mountain, to the Rocky Mountains, uh, particularly uh, the Grand Tetons. My wife always wanted to see the Grand Tetons. So um, we bought a 1970 Pontiac Firebird and had it equipped for trailer pulling, and we bought a trailer. And uh, we took that trailer and we pulled it out to the, uh, to the Rocky Mountains. And uh, we saw the Grand Tetons. And, uh, and on the way home, we stopped in at uh, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, to see my son, who was in the Army at the time. And uh, traveling home from there, we went through West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, parts of North Carolina, and we just liked this part of the country. And we decided that uh, we'd like to uh, retire here. So uh, the following two years, we uh, took the travel trailer and we we visited uh, real estate agencies who specialized in farm and in uh, rural type of uh, uh, properties. And we spent one year looking uh, through uh, West Virginia, but most of the uh, property in West Virginia, the uh, uh, mineral rights were uh, sold already, so you could uh, Any time these companies could come in and drill a well or start digging for coal on your property and you had nothing to say about it. But we decided that we didn't want any part of that. Well, next year we came to uh, North Carolina and we ended up in Burnsville and the uh, real estate agent there had this one property for sale. Um, it was a little bit higher than what we had planned on spending for it. But uh, it was 90 acres. It had a, a two-acre pond. And as soon as we got at the edge of the pond and looked across the pond to the uh, little cottage that was sitting on the edge of it, we decided this was the place we wanted. So uh, we bought that place. Unfortunately, uh, uh, six months after we bought it, uh, that little house burned to the ground. We weren't living in it at the time, I was still working, but uh, uh, I worked for seven more years before we were able to move down here. But uh, we moved down and uh, built, a, uh, uh, built a house myself there. That's how we came to McDowell County. Now, um, you helped for many years with the, uh, the senior centers and uh, with a very particular program. You didn't grow up doing taxes, did you? No, but uh, I always did my own taxes, and uh, uh, I kind of enjoy that kind of stuff. So. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've been helping out people here for many, many, many years? Well, there was a, an ad in the AARP magazine that requesting volunteers uh, back in, I think it was about 1980 or so. We had just moved in, just actually just moved into a, 
the house that you built. And uh, I decided to volunteer, took their training, and uh, I first went to uh, Forest City. They had a, a uh, site there. I worked for a year at Forest City and decided that I'd rather do it in McDowell County since I lived here. And uh, contacted the folks at the senior center and uh, they helped me get some volunteers. Then we set up business here. It's carried on ever since. Who does it today? When your son retired, you got him involved with it all, so yeah, yeah. now he carries on the tradition. How many years did you help people to taxes here in McDowell County? Well, it started in, I think, in 1981. How many years is that? 19 plus 13? Whatever. <laughs> you recently celebrated your 90th birthday. Yeah. I was lucky enough to be there for your party, and you have a fantastic family. And before I left, I asked you this, if, um, if you had any advice to give someone, what kind of advice would that be? And I was wondering if you could think about that just a moment, and could you talk to the camera about, with your life experience, if you're talking to me, what kind of advice you would have for me? I don't remember what I told you. <laughs> I, th I think it was something along the lines of um, be honest, and be true and love your family. I think it's something along those lines. But with your 90 years, do you have any words of advice for Mr. Addison over here as he goes forth on his next 90 years? <laughs> what he should do? Invest? Do you have any investment ideas? Or? That's a tough one. Uh, I guess as Jimmy Valerano says, never give up. <laughs> Thank you for letting me interview you. Oh, you're welcome.